<coughs> Pardon me. Bless you. Cruise it. All right, let's get started. Thank you all for joining. This is the weekly TSC call. It's a public call. Everybody is welcome to join and contribute positively. Um, there are two requirements to doing so. The first one is to be aware and live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is being displayed currently on the Zoom client if you're online, which I think it really is. The other piece is the code of conduct, which basically requires that everybody behaves decently. With that being covered, we can uh, get going with the, the agenda. Before I get further, I wanted to ask, I don't have any announcement. I always take this uh, moment to give a chance if anybody else has any announcements to make, please speak up now. All right, doesn't sound like there is any. That's fine. Let's keep on moving then. We had one quarterly report submitted and we are on time actually. We had, there's no delinquent report. So, um, we had a report from uh, the Iroha, um, Iroha uh, project. From what I've seen, most people have, uh, most of the TSC members have actually checked the box, meaning they have reviewed the pro project's report and didn't raise any questions. There were a few questions that were raised by Sarah, I guess, who filled out the form. Thank you for doing that, Sarah. And um, that I think we can discuss briefly here. Uh, the first one, I think it's for the staff. It has to do with the notification, I guess, for the report. Is that right, Sarah? Yeah, hi. Uh, the thing is that we, again, like received the report like a, only a week before we need to, you know, present it. And, you know, the TSC needs some time to review this as well. So I basically had to write this report uh, during my weekend. I mean, I'm fine with that, but it would be nice <laughs> if we could be notified like in advance. I mean, at least like 10 days in advance. So I would have time to do that, you know, to plan my time for these things. So, you know, so your TSC would have more time to read it through. So uh, it wouldn't be like the last time, the previous quarter, when we, uh, when we basically posted it like three hours before the call or something, because we yeah. didn't have enough time. It would be really nice if, it, if it's not like too difficult. So it's just a tiny note. Maybe it's, it would be also easier for other projects as well, you know, to receive the notification a little bit in advance. All right, Rai, is that yeah. something you control? Who do we send her to? You, you, you let me know, and then I tell me to go and make those edits, and um, I'll do that. All right, can you do that at least for Roja since they asked? Yeah, it's pretty easy. I just have to do it, right? So. All right. Thank you. So okay. that will take care, be taken care of. The second question has to do with maintainer's policy. Uh, this is a pending item, as you point out. Uh, I have the intention to bring it up to the TSC full blown. For now, I sent a request of like, basically I'm in the gathering phase where I'm trying to figure out what the different projects have been doing. Uh, there isn't much, but there are some projects that have some kind of policy. And so I will uh, bring it up. I can't tell you yet whether the TSC will decide that this is, you know, we have a mandatory policy that everybody has to adopt or it will be just a recommended policy and we'll give some of uh, the projects some leeway as to how far they go into implementing it. We'll have to see but you're welcome to participate in the discussion. Oh, okay. Because we like have few ideas and uh, I don't know, should we like write this down or should we wait for a general policy? So the, uh, like, you know, our work wouldn't be like in vain if you decide to on a general policy for all the projects. So, you know, just to know. So, 
Okay, so I'm glad that you're eager to contribute. And my, I mean, the ball is on my side there because I took the action I tend to to put it together in the first place. And and so, you know, I didn't want to start from scratch. I know there are projects that have one. My plan was, okay, I'm gonna try and find out what's out there. And I'm gonna create a, an issue for the TSC to discuss that links to all the different uh, uh, policies that are in, you know, that are being in use today. And then we, once the page is set up, I'll, I'll let everybody know and you can comment on it. And if you have ideas, you want to, you know, the TSC to take into account, that will be the time to chime in. Okay. Okay, yeah, great. Thanks. And then the last point has to do with the code of conduct and, and, you know, practically, I mean, how is it, uh, being displayed or in the repositories, right? Um, I believe that's one of the questions from our uh, developers, one of the developers, because okay. that wasn't my question. Maybe Mikhail here uh, could uh, tell me what, what that was about. Sounds like this is what it's about because it talks about separate file or link or what. And so, I, I mean, just to cut it short, we actually have on the agenda the first item after this is the, the 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 common repository structure, and so that's something we can discuss then. Oh, okay, great. I'll I'll wait for that then. Okay, sure. So so we have no other questions, I think, for now. It's like okay, let me turn to the TSC. Is there any questions otherwise for Sarah? Okay, if not, then we can move on. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so let's move to the discussion items. So as I was just saying, the first item is the common repository structure, and then we'll talk about the discussion, we'll re continue the discussion on the beef proposal. But so the common repository structure, we had this issue a while ago, uh, whether we should have one. There was a proposal to use the to-do groups uh, repo linter. We agreed on that. Uh, there is a, there is actually a little, there is a configuration file that was set up uh, in the GitHub repository uh, that you know makes some changes to the default one uh, to adapt it to Hyperledger, and um, we left it at that, saying if you go to the so if you link click to the link of common repository structure, it points to the the issue the in the decision log with the, you know, marked resolved. And if you look at the formal proposal, basically it says, well, we're going to use this. And where we kind of fell short is that, you know, there was this, there's, it's unclear. I mean, we haven't gone any further into ensuring compliance with this or, you know. And so, yeah, so I, I actually took a, a survey last week I started early at the end of last week. I was kind of looking at the different repo, and uh, I have to say our level of compliance right now is pretty abysmal. It's like it's an exception when a repository is compliant rather than the opposite. And so I think we need to try and improve that. There are some valid questions though. When I actually started looking into it and look at some of the repo that I'm a maintainer of, what it would take to be compliant, because I have to admit, <laughs> even those were not. Um, the I realized that sometimes some of the requirements seem to be a bit bizarre, like you know they're they're not quite relevant, and so and and then there was a change. So Dano, Johan, and you actually raised the question. In, in the comment there, the, you had a question as to whether we should um, change some of the requirements, some of the tests, especially when it comes to like the code of conduct, which is very much in line with the question that was asked by the Iroha team, as to whether, you know, what is the actual content of the code of conduct file? At the beginning, the first, uh, the repo linter configuration file we had, it just tested, there's a file called code of conduct in the, you know, in the repository. And if you add one, that's all you, you, you pass. Um, 
Dano actually submitted a pull request against the configuration file that changes that to a test on the, which is based on the hash. And it means that you have to have the exact same copy as what's in that repository, what's considered to be the reference. And uh, I mean, it sounded like Dano, you raised the question as to, you know, whether that was the thing to do or not. And then I think Rai went ahead and merged. As a result, I can tell you, I ran it again today and against like Fabric, which passed before, and now it fails. And when you look at the details, it's because, oh, well, the code of conduct actually in Fabric is just a pointer to the code of conduct. To the, basically, it says, hey, we have an, uh, this is important. Please make sure you read this stuff, kind of stuff, right? And it has a link to the code of conduct. And of course, the hash is therefore different than the actual, you know, code of conduct with as the full text. And so I think it's a valid, so the, the, this is something we really should discuss. I don't think we should necessarily do that, honestly, because there are pros and cons to this kind of stuff, uh, especially, you know, the if the code of conduct was ever to change, I think it's better to have a link and then and you change it in the one reference place and everything is up to date. If we have copies all over the place, it means anytime we change it, although admittedly, you know, we never change it so far. So maybe that's not really happening often, even if it doesn't open often. If it were to happen, we would have to make sure that all the repos have changed. Uh, and it's kind of a pain. So there are two sets of questions for us to discuss or consider today. There is, you know, how do we move forward on, or, you know, um, the compliance, increasing compliance with the repository structure that we have all agreed we should adopt. And then the next question is, you know, how much do we want to go into, you know, defining the common repository structure reference, you know, especially with regard to files like the code of contact there i think the license and oh yeah the license we fabric fails and when i looked at the difference i was like those files seem to be the same i did a diff and it's like yeah one has one more empty line at the end and of course the hash is different and therefore you fail and i find a bit like okay that's a bit silly but you know admittedly you do a copy once you you commit the change and you're done but this is the kind of stuff I think we should discuss. So, Dano, can you tell me maybe what you thought? I mean, you made that change. I figured you had some opinion that, that this was the right thing to do. Although the way you asked the question, I wasn't completely sure you were convinced either. So, I mean, I was expecting when I put the discussion that I'd be the one to open the discussion with the, uh, to set the stage for it. Um, but the, the questions are, you know, so we have a common structure. We specify there should be three files with content, what the code of conduct is, the license, and the security. Now, the security is an interesting case because um, you advocated for the link method. Um, there was actually a dead link in the security that we're being told to go out and share. So putting a link in there isn't a panacea because links go dead. In this case, the security page that we were pointing to changed. So if we would need to update that, we need to go to everybody's repository and also change it. Um, and it's interesting that when I, when we first went to the repo structure that there wasn't a facility to check file content. You could only check the presence of files or grep for strings in it, like the code of conduct. The check that's the default in repo linear is to check do you have it and does it have the phrase email in it. And that's all it's checking for. Um, so I was able to, to get a patch and accept the patch to check for hashes of files. Um, because according to the charter, we have the Apache license is supposed to be in all of our repos. And so, you know, it's, yeah, there's a difference in the new line, but that's easy enough to fix. You just CP from one repo to the other when, right. you, when you do it. Um, so I, I think checking for fixed file content is a thing to do. And the, the next question is, what is the fixed file content? Um, if we have the code of conduct as text or code of conduct as pointer, it comes out as a hash. So you just copy one or the other you know, what the exact content of those files are is kind of parallel to do we check it with the repo linter. So, you know, I'm less ambivalent about, you know, what's in the file, but more about that we check the files and if it has required content, we should check it strictly, in my opinion. It's the best way to do it. 
to make sure that it is exactly what is intended to be so people don't sneak in crazy things that, you know, hey, we have a code of conduct and we put in there that, you know, some crazy thing is okay that's not. So. Yeah, no, I hear you. All right, so let me turn to the, re to the rest of the people here. Anybody has an opinion? I think in all of this, we, we have like a, a high level intent that there is, uh, you have coverage for important things like the code of conduct. And then once we start getting down to the nitty gritty of how do we, uh, how do we prescribe this in different repositories, I think we can quickly get into the space of micromanagement. Uh, so I'm in favor of whatever the least touch way is to make sure that we've got the important aspects of governance in place. But in this case, I mean, for those three specific files, are you in favor of being a full copy of each file and ensure there are those and nothing else? Uh, so yeah, so at least touch way for me would be, we've got a link uh, for the code of conduct so we don't have to ripple changes everywhere. And, and yeah, I guess that's a good point that a link can break, but if these are important government's, governance documents, those links should not uh, be going down because that's, that implies some other problem too. So uh, I'm in favor of links wherever possible and uh, strict things like hash checks seem fragile. Yeah, this is Chris. I don't, um, look, the, the, the point really is that we want people to be able to find things in the same place in each of the projects. Um, now, whether all of these things are the, exactly the same, you know, or whatever, I think we can, you know, we can noodle on, on a case by case basis. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, you know, the, uh, the license file itself, I think it would be a bad idea to check for um, a specific hash because technically you're supposed to put notes or notices at the bottom of the license file. Um, and so that means that the license is never going to be um, the same if there are notices that you have to add. And so I would think, you know, we, we already, you know, yes, they all have to be Apache licensed. That part is sort of gated on the, on the inbound, um, you know, searching around and trying to find a case where somebody modified the file, I think is maybe something we leave for the, um, the periodic license scan uh, and not the repo linter. Um, so the security, um, that's, a, that's a static file that we copy into each one, sure. Um, and as for the code of conduct, I thought, that we had discussed, and nor normally I would agree with you, Dan, but I think we had discussed that we wanted to copy it into the file and provide the link. Um, anyway, there you go. I mean, so if we you could actually license the uh, notice is actually a parallel file called the notice. No, um, it's, the, yeah, it's the notice file, but if you read the with the actual process, you're supposed to put it in the license. So don't, uh, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, and the notice file, I, I, from what I can tell, nobody has it. <laughs> yeah. Nope. So uh, this is Dave Hughesby. Can I jump in here for a second? Sure. Um, the closest thing we have to this right now is the core infrastructure initiative stuff. And that's just a questionnaire where you self attest that your project has certain things and you add links to the proof. Um, I mean, the easiest way I think to enforce this that would be to combine all these ideas, right? Potentially have just one file called, you know, the checklist or whatever. I don't know what we'll call it, but um, that is standard file. And that asks, you know, where's your license file? 
where's your code of conduct file? And you can either put a, you know, a relative path to a file that's in the repo or a link. And well, then that's what the tool does. It, it goes through and scans and gives you a report and tells you what you got in the wrong places. But yeah. Okay. Fine. Well, I mean, I don't what understand what I'm saying, but that's okay. No, I think, I, mean, I think Dave is suggesting we have a file that points to all the different yeah. files, but it's, it's I would data driven. So then you can say like, if it's left unanswered, then that is an error. If it has an answer and it's a link, but should be a local file, that's a warning. And, you know, so it's data driven um, so that you don't have to go in. I mean, I guess there's a config file in every repo. Yeah. Maybe that's how you would do it. It's the same way. Okay. Never mind. I talked myself out of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But so... And and then there's the question again. We, nobody has spoke up to to this. Is the, I mean, do we? There was I think it was in the in the proposal that we adopted actually that they would we would op periodically run this uh, repo linter against all the repo to get reports done. So I mean, right now it's kind of I mean anybody can try it. And I have, and as I said, it's not a pretty picture. So I'm, I'm kind of inclined to, you know, tell all the maintainers and I, I would, you know, I'm thinking of sending an email to the maintainers list and tell everybody, Hey, we have adopted this, please do your part, make sure your repo is, is compliant. But before I did that, the reason I haven't done that is I wanted to say, okay, maybe you know we should discuss the details because if we don't agree in exactly what uh, it needs to be done then we have an issue because i don't want to have to keep telling people you need to fix your compliance because we changed the reference but i don't know that we need to have a, a, a routinely and i mean there are different options we can just you know let that be and just tell people and then occasionally we can do it uh, we can ask people when they do their quarterly report and, you know, has, we can add to the template, are you compliant or ask them, you know, that would be a, a way to do a checkpoint. I don't know. Do people have ideas on this? I like making it part of the quarterly report. That's a great rhythm to check out your compliance. Yeah. I, I agree. I was about to suggest something similar. Because that, that would be easy indeed, and that would kind of prompt people to do it and say, okay. So say that recommendation again. The, the recommendation is to ask people when they do the quarterly report to add, you know, whether they're compliant or not with the common repo structure. And it's kind of an incentive to, you know, prompting them to actually check and fix it if it's not. Any anybody objecting to this? Dave has his hands up. Is that still true? Or? No, I talked myself out of it. How do I lower my? There it is. Lower my hand. There we go. <laughs> okay, I've heard a few people in favor. Anybody objecting to this? I don't know that we need to make it a formal decision. So, let's keep it casual. All right. Hearing none, I'll I'll do that. Um, just before we move on, because I want to keep enough time for the, the beef uh, proposal, um, I just want to finalize the discussion on the content of the files. It sounded like there was quite a bit of opposition to having full copies, but so we should revert the change that was done, I guess, right? So we will not check on the content of the files, but we'll just keep it at the presence existence check. So if we're not gonna check the hash, one question, there's three proposed files in there, the license, the security, and the code of conduct. Are those contents fine? Do we wanna keep the code of conduct as the text or do we want it to be a pointer? Because the security and license, I think are settled issues. The code of conduct was kind of in flux. You know, whichever way is fine. Yeah. Just pick one. 
link? I think the link would be good. And if you look, in fact, the, in the same repository, if you look up, there is exactly a file with the link. So we could use that and keep the hash test, but you know. Then we don't have the full text, we have a link. I guess that's one, that's one possibility. Could someone post a PR and propose it then? That'll make sure everyone gets the same check. Okay, I, I can do that. All right, I think we are good. Let's move on then. So the beef proposal. We had a first presentation uh, last week um, on the overall proposal and uh, there were some questions raised and then there was a, a different uh, file was submitted to the mailing list which I linked to from the agenda. You need to go back, right? It's in the, it was the sub bullet. Yep, there's a use case. And so we can go through this now. Who is going to present it? I think Takuma was planning on presenting. Are you there? How much time do we want to allocate for that? Well, it's only a few slides, right? So it should be pretty short, I would hope. Yeah, the, but, hi. Uh, the, my name is Shingo Fujimoto. I will uh, present the this slide in short. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's do this then. If you can walk us through those slides pretty quickly, then we can have an open discussion. Yeah. Uh, the, thank you very much for the uh, taking the time. So the, this slide is showing to the, uh, the some of the uh, security models describing to the how the uh, uh, the beef uh, supposedly to be work. Uh, the this slide is showing to the how the procedure will do. Uh, it, uh, the explaining explain about to the uh, the behavior of the beef. So the uh, the you can see the green box in the middle of the uh, the slides. Uh, that that what we call the business logic plugins. Uh, that that is a mandatory module of the BIF. Uh, which will implement to the business logic uh, the, uh, the, that will be de uh, the developed by the users. So the, uh, on the other hand, the two boxes on the, uh, the edge of the uh, left, and, uh, left and right, that was named to the DLTs. Those are supposedly be uh, uh, the one, uh, the independent blockchains like a Ethereum and Quorum in the examples. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the business logic in, uh, the plugin will be invoked to the several other uh, transactions on the, uh, the one of the, uh, the DLTs. For example, the first uh, transaction on your left, uh, that, that will send the money from the source account to the escrow account and uh, that fact will be observed by the plugins and uh, that will be notified to the, uh, the business logic plugins. And then the business logic plugin will invoke to the another transaction on the right DLTs and that will be invoked to the some send money from the other uh, the exchange account to the uh, the, the destinated uh, accounts, and uh, finally the the that factor is also observed by the business logic plugins, and uh, the business logic plugin will uh, the as a response to the that uh, the observations, uh, the third transaction will be uh, the remotely invoked. That will be the uh, the send the escrow account to the uh, the exchange account. So the in the total the uh, the when the user wanted to the one uh, money to the to the another ledger, uh, the the 
exchanger will be the intermediate, but uh, the, they will not to the in, uh, involved to the actual transactions. So the VAF will in, uh, the help to the intermediates to the, those two transactions securely. So they go to the next slide, please. The, this one is actually the showing to the the, uh, the system modules uh, that I explained the zones uh, as are in sequential. So the uh, the way designed to the business logic problem will be the implemented for specific use cases, and we are expecting to the BIF will be your, uh, the infrastructure of the or. Uh, the fundamental libraries to build uh, such uh, solutions. And the business logic is also responsible for the handling to the error cases, like uh, when the one ledger was failed to the uh, to finish the uh, transaction, and that was designed for the to recovering to the such a uh, escrow, the account money will be sent back to the original uh, accounts that was uh, expected, uh, the behavior of the BIF applications. Uh, the, I think the, those are short presentation for the, uh, the question answering to the previous session. Thank you. Thank you. All right, like thank you. Questions. All right, so, I mean, I, I'd like to, the way I would like to put it is, you know, I, I want to first take a moment if, if anybody has more questions to help them understand what the proposal is about. And then uh, we can discuss, you know, how people feel about the proposal, whether we should make a project or should we keep it as a lab? So, <clears throat> I'm, I, again, I struggle with any kind of, integration between different ledgers, but let's leave that aside for the moment. This, what you just described seems to sort of tell the same story as Quilt. Am I completely missing something here? Yeah, Chris, this is quite different from Quilt. Quilt is an implementation of a standard and Quilt only, uh, only works for sort of monetary transactions. The idea is that this works for sort of general sort of smart contract logic. It works for just about anything. And, and I'd also like to add to that, that we had a discussion in one of our previous TSC calls. Uh, we had originally intended to contribute BIF to a quilt, but uh, the TSC thought it was not appropriate uh, to usurp a quilt for other purposes. And so that's why it's not part of quilt. Yeah, the remarkable uh, the difference between, from the code project will be a code is based on the ILP uh, that, that is some sort of the atomic swapping for the always the, the two transaction will be uh, occur at the same time. Uh, that the, uh, the our approach is more like a flexibility for the uh, the, uh, the sequential like and error handlings and those kind of things. So the, but the, uh, the we are need to do some sort of the abstraction for the, uh, to absorb the difference of the, between the ridges. So the initially the we, our project was uh, categorized as uh, interoperability, but uh, in the, at the, uh, the certain discussion uh, figure out the this is a certain mechanism for integrating to the several regions into the one single logic. So the we name to the integrations for the uh, the, the name of the of our product. Is that answering the questions? Well, some of them. So I think. And again, my recollection of that conversation, Tracy, was more along the lines of Quilt seems to be abandoned, hasn't been updated in forever. Can we just take it over? And I didn't, I mean, I think that, you know, you're right. We, we agreed that that wasn't appropriate, but bringing the same context, the, the, the thought process and working to evolve Quilt to incorporate some of the capabilities that you're talking about here doesn't sound like a bad idea at all. 
Whereas what this seems to be doing is setting up a parallel thing that's, you know, yes, it, maybe it's doing some more things or some things slightly differently, but, <clears throat> you know, implementing a hash time lock algorithm in a different language doesn't seem to provide, you know, uh, it, it, I, I think it just sort of continues on this sort of so, path yeah. to having fragmented stuff that doesn't work together. Yeah, yeah, Chris. Uh, I mean, so history for for those of you who may be not familiar with it, um, back in early 2019. Um, so basically, right after I left the Linux Foundation, uh, I was in conversations with Quilt uh, to bring uh, the the Quilt maintainers to bring uh, blockchain integration framework into Quilt. Um, and we were having great conversations. The maintainers were really for it. Um, they were like, this sounds like a great idea. Uh, but as you recall, prop, uh, appropriately, right, uh, Quilt had not filed their quarterly report to the TC um, at about the same time that we were all coming to the uh, conclusion that, yes, it should go into Quilt um, and, and that should happen. So the TSC did think that, you know, uh, maybe it was abandoned and we were trying to overtake it, which we weren't because we were in conversations with the maintainers. Um, and we wanted to kind of do a sub project, but the, there, there was obviously that concern, right? Is, is Quilt going to continue? Is it not going to continue? Uh, maybe it makes more sense to have us do a uh, full project proposal since this is a larger interoperability project than, than just the ILP. Um, so, you know, all I'm saying is like, we've been here, we were told not to do quilt, right? Uh, and so- No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. But again, quilt, you know, there was a bunch of circumstances at the, the same time going on. I know you had been talking with them, but then all of a sudden they all left Ripple and did a startup and then they got really busy. And so they weren't really paying attention to Ripple, uh, to, Ripple uh, to quilt. Um, and uh, now it's been uh, rejuvenated, if you will, and there's somebody that's actively working and they're submitting progress reports and so forth, which is all goodness. Um, but, uh, you know, again, with all the other conversations that we're having, I'm just wondering if, and, and again, there is a JavaScript implementation of Quilt, essentially, of ILP over, in, and I, I've been talking, I don't know if Brian is on today or not, but, you know, I've been saying to Brian and to uh, uh, Chris Borchers uh, over in the, what are they, OpenJS now? Um, <laughs> we should bring these things together. We shouldn't have, you know, a, essentially a single project that's split by virtue of which SDK you happen to like, uh, you know, which, which language you like. Um, it, it just seems to me like we should be trying to bring things together and make things more relevant to each other than just doing it. So I, I hear what you're saying, Tracy, and I just think in the spirit of the conversations we've been having, could we, what can we do to try and make these more smushable? <laughs> if I can use that term. Um. Uh, Mr. Uh, may I speak a little? Uh, the, because of the uh, the code or uh, the IRP is designed for the other uh, hard already mentioned. Uh, the IRP only covers to the uh, the uh, monetary uh, exchange or swap. Uh, the that is uh, uh, the other designed for. And uh, in our white paper, described to the possibility to uh, uh, the uh, or applicability for the different use cases, like uh, if we are uh, the interwork with uh, uh, the different type of ledger, like uh, uh, the for let's say the one ledger had the uh, the build for the uh, the data exchange. And we need to charge for the, such a data exchange as a trade. So the exact use cases cannot be covered by the IRP. Uh, doesn't matter the which programming language will be used. 
So the, as the nature of the ILP is a equivalent value and has to be the swappable uh, cryptographically. So the, uh, the, that was a very limited applicability for the, uh, the nowadays. So the, uh, let's say the, we are having a blockchain application is more like a uh, supply chain management, health care, whatever. Uh, the, those are not covered by the ILPs. So the, that is uh, uh, the current existing issue need to be solved. Yeah, Chris, and when I talked about this, one of the first things we looked about was, you know, should we, you know, as Tracy recalls, should we join Quilt? Should we merge with Quilt? Um, and it was pointed out to us that sort of the charter of Quilt was to implement the ILP standard. Uh, and in this case, we want to do things that are sort of well beyond the ILP standard. You know, our sort of uh, transaction mechanisms go well beyond the sort of, you know, time lock stuff that the ILP is doing. Um, so if, if you dig under the hood, our techniques are sort of very, very different um, from what Quilt is doing. Yeah, so I think this is a valid point. And it, it does touch on the what Tracy was saying. I mean, you know, the previous discussion was basically, hey, you cannot just stop, you know, we use the envelope of the existing project and start doing something quite different. And that's my recollection. And yes, Chris, you're right that, you know, uh, Quilt, uh, you know, the, the, the Interledger protocol is kind of all over the place. I remember pointing that out way back then when they brought it up. Uh, there is a Directory-C community group that works on the spec. At the time, they were trying, shopping around to try to standardize the spec through uh, IETF. They had one implementation for JavaScript in the OpenJS and, and, the, and the Java one here and it's clearly not ideal more for them than anybody else i would say but um but and i agree with chris's point that you know clearly when we considered that question quill seemed to be in complete desire and it would seem wrong to just say oh we have this kind of body you know lying there let's just invade it and use it for a different purpose <laughs> That's kind of what I remembered of this. Uh, it's my interpretation, at least. And so, you know, I think we should just put that aside. I, I don't know if the, the current maintainer uh, of the Quilt project, which I agree with Chris, is clearly Quilt has restarted and we now have somebody who is quite active. I don't know if they, they were part of the discussions that you refer to, Tracy, uh, where yeah, they were. we were excited. Yeah. I'm sorry? They were, they were part of the discussion. So would they still be open to, uh, to working together in one bigger project? Uh, I'm not sure, right? We didn't go to them because that's not yeah. the direction DSC gave us. Yeah, I, uh, I understand. Yeah, actually, the, I had a conversation with uh, some of the community of the IRP communities, but uh, they're, uh, they're very uh, focused on the financial area as their applications. Uh, so the, uh, the, the Ripple uh, or some other uh, vendors, uh, they're more focused on the such area. And uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, the BIF is a different area like uh, uh, the charging or accounting or so on. So the, uh, the, the technically, uh, the, we may have the certain dif uh, similarity, but the approach itself is uh, quite different. And in my understanding, uh, the Kyoto project is certainly scoped for developing to the IRP project uh, protocols that was uh, uh, described as a charter. So they are sent to their un unrest to the, uh, the, the chart that should be covered like a non-financial area, we cannot uh, uh, the merge the two projects. Uh, those are different purposes. That is my understanding. Is that uh, something different view from yours? I'd like to maybe take a step back. I mean, we're discussing from the project view 
what's it going to be like to people that are consumers of both of these projects, right? I'm, I'm assuming Biff is going to stay out of the financial area and, and leave that to Quilt. But, you know, if you're coming in to Hyperledger looking for something you can use for cross-ledger work, you know, how, how are we going to distinguish the two? Well, I mean, I think that's pretty simple, right? If you want to run, if you want an ILP implementation, right, you would run Quilt. If you don't, if you want a general blockchain integration framework, you would use the BIF. Right, but in so, a, a year, are people going to say we should combine these two and have one solution that works, or are they so much different, not in implementation, but in theory of what they do? So in my understanding, Ethereum cannot uh, apply for the ILPs because of the time lock is not implemented for the other standards. So the, that the certain limitation is always exist. If we choose to the different uh, protocol or uh, the platforms nowadays, we have uh, many choices. So the it's that is an existing problem on the market. The time lock is very limited applicability for the technical. Do you know Can how to- Can I say to... something, uh, Arno? Uh, this is Angelo. Um, oh, yeah, Thank so you. I must admit, I, I, I personally struggle to understand why this solution should be uh, used uh, by any blockchain system that is distributed and private. Um, so you, you are describing a solution where there is a centralized party. Uh, so a single point of failure. We are back, in, we are back to a, um, a system where a single point of failure, which blockchain wants to avoid in the first place. And then uh, this solution of the, this guy is a, has access also to both ledgers this routing, uh, this routing piece has access to both ledger. This ledger might have different uh, um, security and privacy requirements. So we are, we are, we are I, I mean, I would, I would be more interested to see what's, because Hyperledger is for the, advance, the, uh, the advancement of uh, blockchain in the enterprise applications, I really would like to see a use case, an enterprise grade use case where you see, hey, these are the requirements, the privacy requirements. These are the, this is where it's acceptable to have a trusted third party that's a single point of failure in a distributed system. I, I struggle to see this, but I might be wrong. Uh, but uh, to me, if, if you are presenting just a, another trusted party in a blockchain system, I mean, what's the point of having a blockchain in the first place? So, so Angelo? So yep. I know it's not split up in this diagram, but you can distribute all of this stuff. And in practice, that's what we're doing. The BIF is not like a, a single entity, like the business logic plugin is going to be a, a decentralized system. So I know it's not drawn like that in this system, but that's how it works practically. All right, sorry, I know it's not like that in this diagram, but. Yeah, uh, well, fair means. enough, fair enough. But they still have, this guy still have access to both ledgers. I mean, and these ledgers might might have very different, I mean, uh, one can be a supply chain and the other one can be a payment system. Uh, I mean, why this guy should, be, should have access to the secrets of the, uh, the supply chain uh, just to connect with the, uh, just to be able to connect with the payment system? I mean, the, maybe the guy who are inside the supply chain might, might want to have some, I mean, why, my, my will not to, to rely on this third party that has access, full access to the to, to both ledgers. Uh, uh, the Andrew, uh, yep. uh, sorry, sorry to, to interrupt you. So the, can you uh, the, can you show up the uh, bring the previous page? Uh, the I explained about the your questions. Yeah. So the, uh, the your question is uh, uh, the, this business logic can be the supervising to the older governance of the region. That is not true. Uh, the, the, in this uh, slide showing to the, this business logic will be a limited uh, the, the privilege on the, uh, the or accessibility for the escrow account on your left. 
So the, uh, the, the first, the money will be escrowed on the, uh, the, such a, uh, the intermediate place. And uh, this business logic can handle or control the, this account as an end user's perspectives. So the, uh, the, the bits business logic plugin only uh, the observed the, uh, the distributed ledger uh, the, that is involving to the both side. And the, uh, the, the when the, uh, the expected event was occurred on the, the other ledgers, uh, the, this business logic plugin will uh, the operate their own account, not using to the super power. So the, for this example, I said to the Ethereum, Ethereum does not have allowing to the any users to have the special power. So the, the uh, this is the fact we our solution is workable without uh, having a uh, uh, risk of the single point of failure. Uh, you, you still have this guy, this, uh, this, uh, this escrow accounts. But anyway, now you are describing us, so that's also, when I saw this, I thought, ah, but they're describing something that can be done with Interledger. So, I mean, I would have expected now, because we are talking about payments here, but then you said that you want to be more general than this. So maybe you should present a com an example that is more complex than payment, where you, we can better see the limits. Uh, actually, yes. I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not, I have nothing against this proposal, I, I must admit. I, I, I only think that you, are, you want to address something that is very, very complex. And uh, not, I mean, even the literature is still not well set on how to solve this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of problem. So I was wondering, who will, who will use this in an enterprise setting where there are the, privacy, the, the security and the privacy requirements are so strict uh, and you really want, I mean, it might be very tough. And the business logic, if you say that you want to be more general than uh, asset transfer, then you are, say, you are kind of saying, hey, yeah, we are really have to, what, do, what does it mean exactly an escrow account for a, a business logic that is not ready to transfer assets? Um, you see? I, I'm sorry, but uh, we had a, a certain uh, the description about and uh, such a wrong, uh, more than the 20 or 50 pages, uh, the white paper describing to the such uh, the various uh, white uh, the use cases, uh, the uh, the one for uh, from the beginning of the very simple one to the uh, the complicated one, uh, the with uh, the uh, the, uh, the describing to the whole sequences as a sequence of discrete uh, diagrams. One of the diagrams was attached in the, this my presentation. Uh, the the showing to the how it work, but uh, that is not appropriate for the TSC discussion for the such a details. So the, uh, yes. the I'd like to ask you to the read out to the some of them to understand the the, the my explanations. But yeah, uh, so uh, I'd, my uh, point is uh, that our solution will not provide to the any single point of failure. This is a kind of uh, the support of the uh, the two peer to peer trading with health as a service. So the because of the our organization hyperledger providing to the enterprise service, but uh, we also need to the interoperability with the public service like uh, Ethereum or uh, the let's say uh, the coder or something. Uh, those are public chains, but public chain cannot be the uh, using to the uh, the the single point of failure. That is a fact. So the all right, let me interrupt you here. I'm sorry system. because we're running out of time, and I, I want to make sure we are ending somewhere here. So I sorry. agree with the point you just made. For the, that matter, that you know, there is only so far we can go in this discussion on the TSC call. And we are not here to actually solve the problem. The point is to understand the problem area enough so that people can form an opinion as to whether this should be made a project at this point or not. 
And this is what I would like to ask people now. We only have three minutes left. I don't know if we have time to, uh, if we want to have a formal vote right now, but who is in support of this? Uh, there are quite a few people who've stayed quiet. I'm generally in support of this type of project. Um, I'm interested to hear more about Angelo's concerns on the architecture and response from the proposers. Uh, and I don't, on the, on the other subject matter of the um, quilt integration, I, I don't see that as a requirement, but if there's um, any additional specifics that come from the quilt quarter to, to provide feedback to this proposal, I'd be interested to hear what they said. I would say that I share Angela's concerns. I tend to prefer an architectural approach that does foreign signature transactions to try to eliminate the need for the, the a routing entity. But I understand the architecture need for this and it's obvious that people have real uses for it. So I, I don't think that's grounds for opposing its creation or moving forward in one way or another. Yeah, so just a comment, we have this, we have 40 pages of white paper if you want to look at sort of uh, the details and, and understand what we're saying here. And if you have concerns, we'd encourage you to look at it. The link is in the proposal document. I think it is unfortunate you guys use the financial <laughs> use case because that falls directly into the ILP stuff. And that's probably not the best way to sell your your idea. But yeah, we, uh, we thought it would be the simplest and easiest to understand. But in hindsight, that was not the correct decision. Yeah, no, I understand. And Anybody uh, else uh, wants to speak up? Uh, just as uh, as a uh, final word, uh, the, we had uh, the, some of the uh, the QA section in the proposal document. So they please look at the. the uh, the, those questions uh, pop up in the, during the, this session will be partially uh, the answered. So we are uh, extending to the, our proposal to solve the uh, existing issues. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for your, all your input and answering the questions. Uh, I think we're gonna close the call on this and uh, that means we'll report to next week on making a decision one way or another. Um, I am in part of it, I heard Hart say pretty clearly before that, you know, one of the motivations to turn this lab into a project is to attract more people and, and make sure that the API, they, they shape up, uh, address everybody's needs so they don't have to revise it later when finally people pay attention. <laughs> I do encourage people to join the lab for that matter. There is no need for the project per se, but, uh, so on this, I'm going to close the call. Thank you very much all for joining. And we'll talk again next week. Goodbye. Thank you Thank very you. much for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.